Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's an enormous privilege not only to contribute to this debate, but to follow the Right Honourable Lady. Madam Deputy Speaker, as a member of the Defence Select Committee, and indeed as the only uh, Northern Ireland parliamentarian contributing uh, in this debate this, debate this evening, I think it is important just to reflect Northern Ireland's role and contribution uh, to our armed forces. Although we make up just less than 3% of the population uh, of the United Kingdom, uh, we contribute far greater, not only to our regular forces, uh, but to the reserve forces uh, across the United Kingdom. And yet at times, we do have to remind colleagues uh, within Parliament that the implementation of the Armed Forces Covenant hasn't been as smooth in Northern Ireland. There have been frustrating barriers and at times inappropriate political ideology that has blocked the full implementation of the Armed Forces Covenant. And it is in that vein that I wish to contribute this evening on the aspect of the Covenant provisions within this Armed Forces Bill. I want to commend the Minister and the Secretary of State for Defence uh, for the fortitude they have shown in recognising that we can do more for veterans uh, who live in Northern Ireland. We should always remember that those veterans who live in Northern Ireland often live within what was their theatre of war. That brings with it added challenges and added complexities. We know, and we've referred to it previously, uh, that our former Health Minister and now Deputy First Minister once wrote to a colleague of mine to say the Armed Forces Covenant does not apply here. She was wrong, Madam Deputy Speaker, and here we have tonight in this bill the opportunity to bring forward a statutory duty to have due regard on public bodies right throughout uh, this United Kingdom. I personally tabled a private member's bill on this back in February 2019, and our party secured from government a commitment in the new decade and new approach document that we needed such a statutory duty. So tonight, I am delighted that the government are bringing forward this commitment and that it is UK-wide, appropriately specifying the bodies involved with the delivery operationally of health, education and housing within the province of Northern Ireland. The Minister will, at the conclusion of this debate, have the opportunity uh, to reflect on some of the contributions uh, within this debate. I would ask him uh, just to respond to some of the questions raised by the Royal British Legion uh, as to why we have confined the provisions of this bill to health, education and housing. If there is an opportunity to include other aspects through the progress of this bill on pensions, employment, social care, immigration issues for those serving from Commonwealth countries, is this not the opportunity to do it? The Secretary of State retains a power in this bill to introduce further aspects. Should there be a more comprehensive trigger mechanism uh, for introducing uh, those aspects to the Armed Forces Bill and the Covenant uh, commitments? There is no uh, requirement within this Armed Forces Bill for ministers, whether in Whitehall or devolved institutions, to have due regard. And I'd be keen to hear uh, from the minister why, when such a due regard clause is present in the Environment Bill, as highlighted by the House of Commons Library, uh, that it wasn't considered appropriate uh, for this. And then just finally ask the Minister, uh, will we see the statutory guidance published before the conclusion of the parliamentary process? I think it would greatly aid our understanding of the operational impact. But let's not forget, Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill is a great strive forward for veterans in this country. I commend the government for bringing it forward, and I will support them through the passage of this bill.